Uh, so I basically prepared, I'll just say I've got more content than we have time to get through today. And I'm going to start off by saying I've kind of inverted some of my presentations this year. So we're going to start with kind of my contact info. And then it's kind of up to you guys what we're going to discuss today. So we'll get, uh, get through a couple slides and then that'll make a little bit more sense here in a minute. So first of all, what I do want to kind of plug, if you're into podcasts, I have one with my colleagues at Kansas State University of Missouri. Uh, we're now into season three. Uh, each episode we shoot for 30 minutes. Sometimes we talk too long and it's 45 minutes. Not every episode will be for everyone. I'll just say that up front. So each episode we try to do 15 per season and go into a, a deep dive into topics about weed science. So sometimes we talk about how a pesticide gets registered. If you're interested in that, it's pretty interesting to me. If you don't care how it's registered, you just want to use it, then skip that one. So, uh, for instance, uh, the one this week, we talked to someone who spent 40 years researching kosher. So this week was all about kosher. So if you're into podcasts, give it a try. Uh, War Against Weeds. Contact info, and then I know this will be posted later and available, but uh, uh, main, main easiest way to probably get a hold of me would be my email there. Then if, if you're on Twitter, uh, that's where you can follow me as well, NDSU Weeds. So I'm going to start with this slide, and then we're going to get into a choose-your-own-adventure. So whenever we just talk about weeds and weed control, I always like to bring it back, especially in the resistance era. We need to know about the weeds we're dealing with, and I think this quote from an ancient Chinese uh, book is very relevant when we talk about weed control and crops. And in general, just if you want to know the relevancy of this book, we actually teach it in the military academy today still. So The Art of War is the book. And this, uh, this quote, broken down into three different sections, I just think is very important when we think about weed control in general. If you know the enemy, in this case weeds, and know yourself, and we'll just say your cropping system or your land, you need not fear the results of 100 battles. So if you know the weeds you're trying to control and you know what you're doing on your own operation, you should have some things looked pretty good. The middle one's probably the one we need to think a lot about in a year-in and year-out basis. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you'll suffer a defeat. So you can be the best corn grower in the world, but if you don't know the weeds, then sometimes they're going to beat you. Sometimes you get lucky and, and will end up beating the weeds at the end of the year. And then basically at the bottom, if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to not have a good time. Okay, so here's where I kind of said we're going we're gonna to invert this. This takes a little bit of participation just really to, to see what you guys want to talk about. It's, uh, it's a lot easier if I just throw a bunch of slides together and not knowing what exactly is on people's minds going this route. And so each one of those topics that's gold and underlined, I basically have maybe 10 to 20 slides, some discussion points to go through. And so basically, given the, that the year is 2022, burn down alternatives, maybe a, a good... Uh, use or a good topic for this group, talking about how do we address, if we can't get our glyphosate needs, how do we address product shortages for burn downs ahead of planting. Horse feeder mare's tail, if you deal with that, problematic in no-till, a few slides there. Most of my data I can present is on water hemp and or palmer amaranth, uh, broken down into four different sections. That dry bean one, it's dry bean focused research. I don't, I don't know if there's any dry bean producers in the room, probably not. Um, but the pre-plant incorporated and pre-emergence treatments would be applicable to sunflower, most of them. So maybe it's of interest. Uh, we may just skip that one, though, just because it's a lot more focused on dry beans. Uh, some kosher things and then enlist label updates. So just to kind of loosen things up. So George, since you first contacted me, what do you want to talk about first? All right, we'll start at the top and you'll kind of see how, how I want this to work. Okay, so you probably have seen this a, a few dozen times probably throughout the winter to date about all the different reasons why we're having some product shortages, and here's my short list. So all the different things on that, on that slide are kind of why we're having some product shortages. The big two, of course, being glyphosate or Roundup and glufosinate. We're starting to hear, of course, of some other active ingredient or product-specific shortages within companies. And that's really driven by people already seeking out alternatives, knowing we may not get our glyphosate or glyphosate shortages. So definitely be in contact with your distributor, with your agronomist, with whoever you, you work with to secure supplies. But again, here's just a short list. Most of them probably related to COVID, work shortages, 
and then some of them were kind of weather-related events around the world uh, that kind of caused different factory slowdowns or shortages. So knowing that we rely mostly on glyphosate for burn down, a couple of just beginning thoughts on glyphosate. Uh, pulled this from, I gave a talk earlier this week about just life without glyphosate in general. But specifically, if we think about it from a burn down perspective, I think it's important to remember it's not just a grass herbicide. We might sometimes get into that mentality that glyphosate's good for my grasses, doesn't kill my broadleaf weeds. It also kills a whole bunch of other broadleaf weeds, and especially in a no-till setting, we may focus on something like mare's tail or, or horseweed because that's the problematic one, it's resistant. But it's going to, glyphosate will pick up a bunch of other random broadleaf weeds out there in the field that we may not generally concern ourselves with. But other herbicides may have weaknesses on. Glyphosate, again, just in general, is very good at hiding our application sins. It is the most forgiving product we've ever gotten our hands on to apply. Uh, wrong carrier volume, wrong boom height, wrong adjuvant, wrong nozzle. Low rates of glyphosate, they still get to the plant, will generally kill a lot of our weeds. So if we're looking for other products than glyphosate, just remember that kind of means we're, we're going to have to uh, be on top of our application game, right nozzles, everything. Other products won't be as forgiving as glyphosate. I'll just skip the third one. That's just kind of a general thought over the last 30 years. As we get into resistance, we're becoming better at scouting for weeds again and weed ID. And then one thing I'll kind of touch on at, at, the, at the end of this section, the one thing we need to remember with glyphosate is it does make other products look better, even on glyphosate-resistant weeds. So one question we might get, or I certainly get a lot, is I've got enough glyphosate to cover half my acres. Can I take that and spread it out over all my acres if I cut the rate in half? In general, no, but it's agronomy, so there's always some exceptions, right? <laughs> And so I'll show a little bit of data on, on glyphosate-resistant horseweed, but a general thought of mine for, I'll just say for grasses, if we're dealing with some new uh, summer annual grasses, if we get into a late planting situation, uh, down to a pint might be okay. I don't really want to go less than 22 fluid ounces of a four and a half pound glyphosate, such as Roundup Paramax. Winter annual or perennial grasses, that's, that's a different story, but just grasses in general, if they're small, that's maybe the one situation where I'm a little bit more comfortable with a lower rate. Okay, so if, let's just say we can't get all the glyphosate we want. What's the other burn down alternatives? And I have a, a few slides kind of on each one of these, and I'll just say this is a list of herbicides I get asked about for burn down alternatives. I'm not going to recommend everyone on this list, and I'm going to kind of talk through some of the points of why. I'm not going to recommend some of them in a burn down situation, but here's basically some of the products that may, may get forced into that burn down market. So, starting with those group 22 herbicides, which is mainly Paraquat or Gramoxone, and then we do have Diquat, Reglone, fits, it's the same mode of action. Additional thoughts with that chemistry in general is that they will always benefit from the addition of a photosystem 2 inhibitor, such as atrazine or metribuzin. So there is a synergistic reaction with Paraquat and Diquat as well with those, those photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicides. Uh, one example I'll give kind of ties into the next bullet point, uh, that these herbicides will also look better on broadleaf weeds with a growth regulator, like 2,4-D or dicamba. And one example I'll give, so I'm originally from Maryland, big no-till state on the East Coast at least, and glyphosate-resistant horseweed was first dis uh, discovered in the Maryland, Delaware area. And before we got sharpened on the market, before we got into extend or enlist soybeans, really the gold standard for burn down in the spring was the gramoxone, metribuzin, photosystem 2 inhibitor, and then 2,4-D, about 14 days ahead of planting. So that was kind of the old golden standard before sharpened, before uh, those, those type, um, extend soybeans. Yeah, George. How much? Yep, great question. So how much metribuzin do we need to make gramoxone work better? So in, in general, if you also want it for other things, such as some residual, uh, four ounces of product will actually get you the, um, the added benefit as well. We've tested going much lower. Uh, some years we've seen a benefit out of two ounces of dry product, I'm saying. So two ounces of a dry product. Of course, you wouldn't get much residual 
Some years we saw that benefit, others not. So I am more comfortable saying at least four ounces of a product. And then again, if you want some actual residual, go a little bit higher than that. And if you're curious, basically what happens is paraquat, gramoxone, we think of it as a contact herbicide. It actually is systemic. So if you applied it at night or in the evening and then didn't get the sun come out for two days, it actually does move throughout the plant. But as soon as there's sunlight, then it, it, uh, it, it destroys the cells that it's located within. So on a sunny day we sprayed, it basically kills plants within hours we see the activity. Those photosystem II her uh, inhibiting herbicides, they actually slow down the electron transport chain to the mode of action that Paraquat works on. So it slows down the whole system, so weed control may take a little bit longer, but it allows Paraquat to translocate within the plant a little bit better. So overall, weed control seven to 14 days later is better. It is slower though, so a little, little chemical or physiology there of what's happening within the plant, why those two work good together. One thing I'll mention, so we, we do know when it's hotter, things like Paraquat work better, but I will say that these group 22 herbicides in general are more weatherproof, so to say, than something like Dicamba or 2,4-D. Our systemic herbicides, we need plants to be actively growing for them to, to really work well on weeds. These ones, if we get into a cool stretch, we don't necessarily need the plants to be actively growing to really kill them off. So you can think of them as a little bit more weatherproof than our auxin herbicides. Some additional thoughts on the two active. So Paraquat, uh, of course, excellent on broadleaf weeds, non-selective. Looking at grass control, we can get some good control on young annual grasses. If it's a winter annual or a perennial that is overwintered, though, that's a different story. We'll burn the tops off. Um, sometimes with that metribuzin type rate, we can get our winter annual grasses uh, terminated somewhat decently well, but it's not going to hold a candle to glyphosate, for instance. And then diquat, just because I get asked the question, I have it on the slide as an honorary mention. I'm not going to recommend it in the burn down market. Uh, Paraquat is just a much better herbicide for weed control, especially early season. So I just wanted to mention it's an option, it's out there, but I, I would not really recommend it for weed control, at least in this situation. All right, the other uh, class of herbicides we'll use quite a bit of is the group 14 herbicides. Uh, so the main ones for a burn down would be Sharpen, uh, Reviton, and then we do use some AIM, uh, especially the further west you go in North Dakota, probably the same down here, Sunflower market, we use a lot of Spartan Charge, and we'll rely on AIM for burn down of small kochia, small wild buckwheat. Otherwise, for most purposes, we're gonna focus on Sharpen as kind of the product of choice for a burn down situation. But no matter which one you choose, MSO is really what we wanna use. So all those, as far as adjuvants, MSO is gonna be the best adjuvant for those three herbicides especially in burn down situations. All of them will also benefit from AMS, but if you don't have MSO in the tank, you're not gonna be happy with performance. Looking at the individual actives, so safflofenacil or Sharpen, uh, one, one thing to note here is it is synergistic with glyphosate, even on glyphosate resistant weeds. So Sharpen by itself or safflofenacil is pretty good on a lot of broadleaf weeds, even better again with that 22 ounce rate, fluid ounce rate of glyphosate even on glyphosate-resistant weeds, and I'll show some data here in a slide or two. It does need help on grasses. It's, it's not gonna control any grasses post-emergence. Reviton, did anyone kind of get to play around with Reviton last year? Last year was the launch year. Maybe a hand or two, maybe that was just scratching the head. So last year was the launch year of this product. The, the active ingredient is TFNSL, same chemical family as Sharpen. And really as universities, we had last year to play around with it. So it's kind of a weird situation where the launch year was the first year we even got to evaluate the product. Some generalizations, talk to my colleagues, we, we can think of it in many ways as a weaker sharpen on some of our problematic weeds. So it's not gonna be nearly as good on kochia. And I've got a data slide presenting that. Um, if you compare it though to something like lamb's quarters or wild buckwheat, it's actually looked pretty equivalent for us. I was thumbing through the uh, research guide that Paul Johnson puts together, and his data seemed to really mimic what we were seeing up north on some of those weeds like lamb's quarters, 
pretty similar to Sharpen, maybe weaker on some other things. One thing I want to mention is grass. We kind of heard a claim that Reviton is going to be better than grass on Sharpen, uh, better on grasses than Sharpen. I'm not going to say that's a glowing endorsement, though. Better than 10% doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a grass product. The one exception would be maybe wild oats. So we've gotten some decent burn down on small wild oats for that product. Uh, looked a lot better with glyphosate, I'll just say that. If you're relying on that by itself, like Sharpen, don't, don't count on what you would be happy with as far as grass control is concerned. And then I kind of mentioned there with a really small weeds, less than two inches, um, and really kosher wild buckwheat are our targets up north at least for that product for a burn down. The other two would generally be better on broad spectrum weeds. Is there any antagonism with uh, Roundup and Sharpen on the grasses or like on cheap grass or is it still pretty good? Yeah, so the question, any antagonism between Roundup and Sharpen on the grasses? So in this case, sharpen antagonizing glyphosate. I think, I would imagine if we add up all the data sets everywhere, we'll probably see that, probably on perennial grasses. For the most part, it, it doesn't really antag, sharpen won't really antagonize glyphosate on grasses all that much. Um, especially if it's smaller grasses, winter annuals, summer annuals, I don't think we've been able to see that. Perennials, I can see that being the case though. If you have a perennial grass and you just, burn off some of that tissue, reduce the translocation a little bit. But I, don't, I can't recall an instance where we've seen that on annual grasses. Would you use an HSLC instead of an MSO then? So, yeah, so then HSOC instead of an, of an MSO. If I was going to go with that, an HSMOC would be the only one I'd probably look at. But really, what's been interesting is that the MSO plus AMS, we just, even with that chemistry, and oil adjuvants haven't seen those antagonized glyphosate when it's tank mixed with Sharpen. So even though we know that can be a possibility and it's maybe we just haven't sprayed enough in severe droughts to see that actually occur because we know physiologically it can, I don't think we've seen that actually play out in the field. But if you, if you felt more comfortable with an HSMOC, then that would certainly be a, a good happy medium that you know is getting both your adjuvant needs for glyphosate and, and Sharpen. Okay, so I've had this up here for 20 or seconds or so, but uh, so here's some research from Minot. So Dr. Brian Jenks is a weed scientist up there, and uh, he deals a lot with kochia. So that's really the primary focus of this slide. But uh, I'll just say Minot was probably a historic drought this past spring. So keep that in mind when kind of looking at the data on the slide here. Uh, and in general, both Sharpen and Reviton, those Group 14 products just did not perform well. Uh, typically, we'd, we'd expect much better control and sharpen um, at an ounce. Two ounces is even better. Uh, but this was, again, without glyphosate. So we do see a, a bump or a benefit having glyphosate in there with sharpen. Um, in a very drought-stressed condition in year, gramoxone, that's 40 fluid ounces of a two-pound gramoxone, uh, was by far the best treatment on kochia. I'd expect uh, similar results on if you have water hemp up before you plant because gramoxone really is the best pigweed herbicide that we have, but Sharpen is also pretty good on, on water hemp and other pigweeds. So maybe these two would look a little bit closer if pigweeds were your focus in a late planting situation, but on kosher, gramoxone, dry environments was by far the best. If, uh, if you don't have kosher, lamb's quarters, you can see they're basically similar control between the, the four products there on the screen. So again, if, if you have a field-by-field -field basis and you're trying to figure out whatever products you can get and you only have lamb's quarters up when you go to a burn down, Reviton may be a good fit for you or some other products. So just want to keep that in the back of our mind as well. Um, this one's really focused on kosha. So is there a lot of people in the room that deal with kosha? I'm going to take that as a yes. Why'd you ask that, you idiot? <laughs> Okay, so more, more information from Brian. Um, a lot of these will really fit into a soybean type um, burn down situation. So in general, we've been having great success in no-till with some valor in the fall, suppressing that first flush of kochia. And then and what Brian Jenks again has done over the past several years, probably half a decade of those types of programs. But he really wanted to focus a lot more on spring 
um, applications this past year. So he did have two treatments where it's a fall valor, followed by, in this case, either authority MTZ or a, a tank mix of Spartan plus Sharpen. So two of these treatments did have that fall valor application. We did not show the ratings for that by itself. These are all seven days. Um, June 2nd will be about seven days after the burn down application on about two inch tall kosha. And I just wanted to show that, and basically um, should, should again mention, with the exception of the Reglone plus Metribuzin, all these uh, different treatments did have AMS plus MSO as the adjuvants. And so Spartan Charge, Authority MTZ, again, Fall, Valor, or just Authority MTZ by itself. Spartan plus Sharpen with and without the, the Fall application, and then Reglone plus Metribuzin Glyphosate by themselves. Uh, with the exception of the bottom two, we basically got 95 to 99% control burn down of the kosher that was out in the field with those top several uh, treatments. Where we saw some weaknesses, um, again, was, was Reglone plus Metribuzin and then glyphosate by itself on resistant kosher. So June 2nd is really the date I want to focus on here because that's reflecting the burn down applications for the most part. By June 10th, we're also dealing with maybe an additional flush of kosher reflected in those ratings. What we've seen the past couple of years, I should say what Brian has seen, Dr. Jenks, is that Authority MTZ is really shining for us in kosher burn down. So you're getting a little bit of burn out of that soft fincher zone in there, but then metribuzin, we don't really talk about it too much as it's, for its burn down potential, but in that tank mix, we're, we're certainly seeing us, we're able to clean up small kosher that's still emerged and get very good residual as well. So that, that's a product we're certainly looking at a lot more in future years uh, for the soybean market for burn down and residual on kosher. A couple last points about the group 14 herbicides. Uh, so I presented a couple uh, co-presentations with one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Brian Young at Purdue. So if you see Purdue in the bottom left corner, these are his slides, but he gave me permission to use them. Uh, so this is basically showing the solubility of safflofenacil at different spray solution pHs. So that's four on the left and then nine, a pH of nine on the right. So looking at those, what do you think, which of those vials is, is safflofenacil most soluble in? It's not a trick question. How does this go, left or right? Right, all right. I was gonna say, I even gave you the, the correct answer, right. So, pH of 7.7, pH of 9 is clear because safflofenacil is fully solubilized in that solution. And when we talk about uptake by weeds in a burn down type situation, a soluble herbicide is easier to pass through a weed. Now, in general, and this gets a little deep into chemistry, but once we add glyphosate to a tank, we get down to this 5 or so pH. So, that's what's kind of interesting. If, if we're just relying on Sharpen or safflofenacil, we actually would like to raise that pH because it's gonna be more soluble, easier to control the weeds that are out there. A lot of times we throw acidifiers or other things into the tank and if we're just relying on Sharpen and we lower the pH, we can expect a little bit less control compared to adding a basic blend type adjuvant and raising the pH or just adding Sharpen to water if you have a high pH water to start with. But all that being considered, even again, um, this is on, we got a little shade going on, on the top, but this is glyphosate plus safflofenacil. These are cut rates of the herbicides, trying to tease out some adjuvant differences on glyphosate resistant horseweed. That's really what's cut off on well, the top of that, those, that um, screen over there. So at a pH of five, what we're seeing is NIS, COC, and then MSO, and the safflofenacil sharpened labels say add MSO, and that's basically why. So pH of five, again, sharpen itself will be less water soluble. We need an oil to help get a less water soluble chemical into a plant. When we artificially raise that pH of the spray solution, in general, things look better. And in this case, NIS by itself was actually a decent adjuvant. It's because safflofenacil will be more water soluble at that pH, and so NIS will help more water soluble herbicides. Um, MSO, of course, still the best. And even at cut rates, got close to 95% control of, of horseweed. So again, really pointing out, this would be important on glyphosate resistant weeds if you save your glyphosate to tank mix with safflofenacil. If you're dealing with horseweed, if we can get that pH close to neutral, 
that last uh, or the first slide, I guess, in this series show that pH 9 was most soluble, but we do get some breakdown of safflofenacil at higher pHs. So neutral would be what we were shooting for if we wanted to artificially adjust the pH of that spray solution. Okay, growth regulators. So probably pretty familiar with both dicamba and 2,4-D. I just kind of threw there. Uh, in, in my mind, in, in our geography up north, I know this would be very similar for you guys as well. Advantage in the spring of dicamba over 2,4-D, uh, we're really seeing kochia and horseweed. So we know 2,4-D is going to be very good on horseweed once we get into uh, spring and summer. For instance, in the enlist system, we know it's going to be a great product for horseweed in season. But in general, broad, broad brush here, cooler conditions, dicamba is going to be better than 2,4-D on horseweed in spring burndown situations. And of course, it's, it's going to clearly outshine kochia basically every time. A, little, or a few notes here on haloxifen methyl, which is elevore. So if, if you grow, grow wheat, you know this product in a number of different premixes, Pixaro, Wider Match, Culex. The standalone by itself is elevore, which, and again, kind of an interesting background here. This is a, a herbicide initially brought to the market just for horse weed control. So we're kind of into the era of we don't get too many new herbicides year in and year out. And if a company finds one that's good on a globally important weed, they will bring it forward. So initially, that product brought for horseweed burn down on the global market. Other weeds that we found it's, it's good on, common ragweed. So really, those two weeds, if they're up when you're having a burn down application, Elevore is going to be a good product on. If you have more broad spectrum broadleafs than that, uh, it's going to be generally pretty weak, especially compared to dicamba or 2,4-D. Uh, and just maybe another just note for Elevore itself, compared to dicamba or 2,4-D, we do have a more favorable plant back for things like sunflower, uh, if there's any canola growers down here, and it's 14 days to, to soybean as well. Okay, last, uh, should be the last series here for alternative burndowns. Get asked a lot about, going back to last summer really, uh, using the group one herbicides for burn down of grasses. If we can't get glyphosate, if you've noticed, basically every other product along the way is not a grass product. And so the group one herbicides would be good on grasses. So grasses only, however, pretty poor performance on grasses in cool conditions. So they're not gonna hold a candle to glyphosate in a, in a burn down if we're in a very cool pattern. If it's burned down ahead of sunflowers, and we have a pretty hot May, maybe things will look a little bit better. But again, in general, cooler conditions in the spring, not, not gonna be as good on grasses. Um, just kind of as a footnote, mid-south cotton country, they'll often use uh, group one herbicides as a burn down uh, in that situation, mainly for Italian ryegrass control, where they have glyphosate resistant Italian ryegrass. And a footnote just again showing what, what type of rates they recommend is basically a pint of a one pound clethodim. So select max. Most of our generics are a two pound, so that'd be a half pint of a two pound generic clethodim is the minimum recommendation in those geographies for using that as a burn down product. So if you wanna try a group one herbicide in a burn down, you, we, we, need, we need to keep those rates quite high. Now that's in a normal year. Um, this is another group of products I'm hearing a lot about very tight supply. Um, we're probably going to be very similar um, pipeline-wise, so at least what I've heard in, in my geography is branded select will run out, and then Targa, which is probably the main generic competitor to Assure 2, is already out. So in a normal year, that's some kind of thoughts on a burn down, but with tight supply and increased prices, I'd much rather save those products for our post-emergence applications, uh, volunteer corn control, and any other grasses we need to control in season. And then short, short note there, glufosinate, don't use it in a burn down. That's just the easiest way to say. We need heat, humidity, and sunlight on a normal year, let alone a year where it's gonna be four to eight times as expensive if we can even get some. Okay, so this is just a little bit of data showing glyphosate versus group one. I'm just gonna show this slide and skip the, uh, skip the next two, really. Uh, but for cereal rye and winter wheat um, cover crops, Back in 2017, we had a pretty cool wet spring in the Fargo area, and so this is some data from our sugar beet agronomist. 
Uh, and basically, he wanted to terminate these crops early to plant sugar beets. Uh, and basically, uh, the, the first two lines here, that's Roundup Power Max at 28 fluid ounces, which is a pound of glyphosate, and then Select Max, again, six fluid ounces, so not probably half of what we should be for a burn down situation. Uh, but basically, uh, what's this, about a month or so after the burn down application, 5% weed control is really just a courtesy at this point. And I basically didn't touch the cereal rye. So in cool, wet conditions, the group one herbicides, that rate we're used to using in crop, uh, basically were, were not good for control of, of rye. Got some benefit on wheat, but not as good as glyphosate. So we can maybe call these surrogates to other winter annual grasses we may be trying to control with those herbicides. That's the main message there. So, clicking on my smiley face will bring us back to the beginning. Before we choose the next topic, any questions on, on that first section there? Have you ever mixed Roundup and Paraquat together? Have we mixed Roundup and Paraquat together? Yes, we have. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> so, on uh, most situations, you may not see any compromise on broadleaf control. That one, you will see a definite compromise on grass control. <coughs> Different adjuvant requirements, typically. Well, you can use an IS for both, I guess, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Any other burn down type questions? Buck trill, thoughts on that? Buck trill. <laughs> Buckthrill and kosher, it's good on kosher. Um, it, it should fit well into a burn down type situation as well. And that's another one where depending on the crop you're trying to go ahead of, would benefit from a, uh, let's see, well, uh, I was getting ahead of myself. And corn, I was thinking it, it does benefit with the group 27 herbicide actually. So it's photosystem two inhibitors, but in general, yeah, if you call the kosher small, it would be decent. I'm guessing buck trail supply is pretty good. No, I'm glad that I don't know. But my <laughs> guys are using like Pixaro and Proto-Flowers, let's we'll say, so um, just worry about, uh, I guess, getting weak on that star. Game, so. Yeah, so as long as you catch it small and really coaches the driver, I don't see why it wouldn't work in that situation. It's just not going to be as broad spectrum as some of the other options. And yeah, would save your star rain for in crop too, or sorry, for your wheat acres and, and get away from star rain dependence, I guess. How big of an issue do you see that with resistant kosher on the star rain? I mean, I'm guessing that's why they came out with wide AR mesh to get four more ounces of star rain in that Yeah, so a generalized question was resistance of kosher to star rain. So far, we've been relatively lucky. I think we have a dozen or so populations we know uh, we're having some issues with. It's not as widespread as, say, Kansas or Colorado, where they have some pretty full-blown starring resistance. It's a concern of ours, definitely. So one of our recommendations for small grains um, going into this year and really the future, uh, we have a couple of just generalizations for kosher, and star, or for kosher control in small grains. Three, three inch kosher is really what we're trying to control. Broad stroke across all products. Specifically to starring, we want to make sure we have the rate high enough. So several of the premixes we have available, if you look at the rate of starring, it's maybe less than 1.5 ounces acid of starring, uh, which is that, what, three, three eighths of a pint? Uh, 0.35 pints of starring ultra. Um, Many of the premixes, that rate's actually a little bit low. And we really want at least an ounce and a half acid of starane, fluoroxapyr, to get good control in kosher, ideally up to two ounces of fluoroxapyr. So many of those premixes will allow you to spike in more starane to get that rate higher. And, and that's really what we want to shoot for to really finish these kosher plants off, because a lot of times, you've, you've seen them, they'll curl down, stay in stasis, and then once we cut the weed off, maybe they'll rebranch from that. And multiple years in a row of that is really our concern for shifting towards fluoroxapyr starring resistance. All right, I've heard, before I got here, I've heard kosher and water hemp problems in this area. Which one do we want to go with? 
Kosha. I heard Kosha first. <laughs> okay, so for us, we, have a, we pick a weed of the year each year for, for our weed guide and write up about a one-page thing and, um, and highlight it. Uh, we, in North Dakota, we just had, what's the most polite way to put it? Kosha kicked our butts this year. Maybe it's the most polite way to put it. And I'm, I'm sure very similar for you guys. And we just were so dry statewide for so long. A lot of kosher. One of these years where some poor soul in Bismarck had to get the snow plow out, I guess, for kosher back in November. So for us, at least, um, we're anticipating kosher to be a lot bigger problem, or maybe not bigger, but just as problematic in 2022 as this past year. Okay, we know what it looks like. But I do like showing this slide. Uh, so this is back from a decade and a half ago in Kansas, where they first found glyphosate-resistant kochia. And so just kind of a general you know, awareness PR campaign, since this is you know, where they first saw it. Kim Fallow in this situation sprayed glyphosate. Everything died except for that weird line of kochia. And so it's always a good reminder of you may have had perfect kochia control in your field, uh, but if you certainly have lines like that coming into your field, you could have gotten resistance or other issues of, from kosher blowing into your field. And, of course, just showing the tumbleweed dispersal nature of kosher. So, again, at the beginning, I said we kind of have to know the enemy. So some biology thoughts on kosher, or some information, I should say. Again, some of the reasons why it's really a problem for us is really these mats that develop of kosher in the spring where we have hundreds or thousands of plants per square foot. And that's, of course, an issue for uh, coverage in a burndown situation. And I'll show probably just one slide. I don't think I'll have a whole lot of data in here of why we're looking at fall applications of valor in our geography. It's not necessarily to get 100% control of kochia into June. A lot of times, if we can get 50% control, that thins the herd, so to speak, of these mats. It makes our spring, down, our spring burn down applications um, more effective because we're getting better coverage. I mean, we basically know some of these things about the dry saline soils. As far as seed production, about 30,000 seed per plant. On average, I think is that 10 to 15,000 range in competition with our crops. So compared to wild oats, which is 100 or so per, per plant, relatively high seed producer. <laughs> The seed itself is really the one chink in the armor if we talk about control or management. And so, uh, if basically, if we could get statewide control of kosher for two years in a row, we'd actually stand a pretty good chance of not having it be a major problem for us. The seed is not that long-lived. Compared to lamb's quarters, velvet leaf, maybe 50-plus years in the soil, it's viable. Most kosher, 99%, is no longer viable after, after two years. Of the research we've done is about 95% is no longer viable after that first year. So basically, whatever kosher was made this year, we get to this point next year. If we had statewide control, no seed production, we'd be dealing with about 5% of the seed that was produced still viable going into 2023. Management challenges for us, and I'm going to suspect this is perfectly mirrors uh, for you guys as well, but just kind of the, the typical resistance that we built up over the last 60, 70 years to 2,4-D, our ALS inhibiting herbicides. Maybe three to four years ago, we would say glyphosate resistance was increasing for us. Now we're calling it widespread. Um, glyphosate resistant kosher probably most in this room. I wouldn't raise my hand up either because I hate this stuff, but probably a few of us dealing with it at least. You asked if there's Yes. All right. One brave soul. I'll admit that we have it too. That's two of us. Two of us are dealing with it. And again, for us in general, so far to date, limited dicamba and starring resistance. Talk to people down in, in western Kansas, western Nebraska, that's maybe widespread dicamba, Clorox pure resistance, starring resistance. We're not there yet. Hopefully you guys aren't either because that makes uh, control much more challenging. Um, and then just germination, typically early, but what we've seen, uh, North Dakota at least, past couple years, we've had so many areas that are so dry that it's really that first rainfall occurs in June or July, and that's when our kosher emerges. 
So in general, it's going to emerge early, but it, it's going to emerge when we finally get moisture is really the other important piece of information. Okay, so you probably see similar, if not this exact picture. Again, just wanted to highlight what we've had success with is Valor in the fall. In this case, this particular burn down, mainly why Metribuzin and 24D were included, were to control all the winter annual weeds in the fall. The Valor is there to get us kosher control into the spring. Um, I guess I should ask, has anyone in this room tried the fall Valor down here? A couple of heads nodding. Okay, several hands up. Working well, most part. I, I guess I get a little bit concerned the further south we go. Um, it works for us because we're frozen for maybe an, another month or two than you guys. And it's really we're relying on the snowfall melt in the spring to activate kosher. So for us, it works pretty well. I, just, I think the further south we go, the less effective it will be uh, because of just less time the ground is frozen. Um, you know, I didn't see a whole lot of snow in this area, so you'll still want some precipitation to activate it. Uh, but basically, this is a best case scenario in this picture to getting that good of control of kosher into June. Like I said, a lot of times we're trying to get 50% reduction in the, in the spring, maybe all we see, but that helps us a lot better, sets us up better for our spring burn down applications. Showed this slide already earlier, so it's also part of this, this kosher um, component. Okay, for those who haven't cut up from the top, just some general thoughts of the products that work on glyphosate resistant kosher in soybeans. And so again, starting with the good burn down, gramoxone has really been the best for us. Uh, Sharpen's probably next best once we have, if we have glyphosate in there as well. Um, metribuzin, again, gets us a lot of good, we get a lot of good activity out of metribuzin as well. So uh, gramoxone, metribuzin, uh, very good burn down on the kosher that's out there. We do want to have some residuals out there for control of kosher, and we're pretty limited in soybeans for what's effective residual compared to something like water hemp, where we have a lot more products that give us residual control. So for kosher, we're really relying on sulfentrazone, uh, and metribuzin would really be the, the top two or best products for residual control of kosher. Valor, we can see some good control. Uh, what we've seen in our geography is sulfentrazone or Spartan is the better product compared to Valor in the spring. Now in the fall, it's Valor only. Sulfentrazone is more water soluble, so we lose a bunch of that in the fall applications, but in the spring, we kind of want that water solubility to get, uh, get the herbicide activated if we have a low rainfall situation. So those top two, the Authority Spartan products and Sencor would be the best, and then Valor and Zidual, we can get some residual control as well on, on kosher. And then really timely post-emergence treatments of, uh, we can use Flexstar on very small kosher on any traded soybean. Uh, we've seen a lot more success, frankly, with dicamba and the Extend soybean systems. Um, and then glufosinate, when we can get that, uh, we can get some pretty good control there again as well on kosher for us. So really, an Extend Flex type soybean may be one of your best setups for options in crop to control kosher and soybean. Um, we get questions about the, how does the enlist system work on soybean? And so, if you know basically how 24D works on kosher, no surprise what I'm about to share. But just kind of wanted to show that we are looking at some data because we get asked, okay, well that's a quarter pound of 24D. We can use a pound of 24D in the enlist soybean system. Well, it still doesn't work for us. So we, and I, I think this is probably applicable for everyone. So. <clears throat> This is just a bunch of different treatments that can be used in the ENLIST system for control of kosher and, and other weeds in general. Um, really want to focus uh, for today just kind of on these bottom ones here. So the ENLIST duo is glyphosate plus 2,4-D and then ENLIST one is, is by itself. And then further up there we have Liberty plus ENLIST duo and Liberty plus ENLIST one. And in general, uh, this particular data set over a couple of years we have separated seven days later, kosher that was smaller than two inches and bigger than two inches, just out of curiosity, really. And in general, again, 240 by itself won't do anything for you. On our glyphosate-resistant kosher, um, we still did see a benefit, so even though 240 doesn't really work and we have some glyphosate resistance, we still got 60 to 70% control, which no one in this room would be happy with, but just kind of showing we, we can get some actual activity. And so really, in an enlist or an E3 soybean, uh, 
Uh, tank mixes of 240 and Liberty do tend to be the best. So if you're in that enlist soybean, we're really relying on the Liberty, but we can see a benefit uh, even on kosher with having some enlist in the tank as well. But that's, if you can't get Liberty this year, then that's not gonna work for you in the enlist soybean system. And so that's why we push our, our growers towards extend if you have kosher as your primary concern in soybean. Okay, I did mention this earlier with, um, with wheat. So there's, there's what I was trying to pull out of my head. Two ounces of Florox pure is the equivalent of 0.35 pints of Starian Ultra. And so that's where we're trying to get to uh, with many of our premixes in wheat. So again, some of our, our premixes don't have that much. If the label allows, we can spike an extra Starian. We'll see a benefit on kosher. And if that kosher does get bigger than three inches, up to six inches, we don't want to spray in that big but it's really starring that we're gonna get any activity out of on taller kosha. So that's why the other reason we wanna keep that rate up for controlling taller kosha. Wheat breakdowns, mainly winter wheat, some spring wheat guys in the room. Just all the data that we're gonna have is gonna be for spring wheat herbicides, but many of them are applicable, of course, in the winter wheat market. Uh, so this is just some, some data uh, from one of our researchers, Dr. Kirk Hallett, uh, who works primarily on small grains. A bunch of the different products that we'll use um, uh, on, in our spring wheat market. One to highlight here, that last slide I said we're looking at a minimum of three active ingredients is what we want uh, for best control of kosher. And don't, we don't really always highlight some products, but for us, Hus Husky FX has been the best product in, in recent years for kosher control. And that's from Fargo to Minot. <laughs> So we're seeing that across the wide geography that that product's performing quite well. One caveat that we'll, we'll kind of point out is at the 18 ounce rate. So 15.5 ounces is probably the most common or the most marketed rate. Uh, we would like to see the 18 ounce rate if kosher is your primary concern as a weed. Just a couple of other products there and one we'll always kind of point out, uh, Talonor does perform quite well, but sometimes it may take us four weeks to see that true control. But Talonor Husky by themselves are pretty good. They, they don't have starring in there. You can spike some in if you wish for better kosher control. And that's basically what Husky FX is. It's just Husky plus starring. So just showing basically there in picture form and our lighting's not the best, so we'll kind of skip the pictures. But that's also in, in, um, for the small grain market. I don't have slides for control in corn basically because we're still getting a lot of utility out of atrazine plus a group 27 herbicide tank mix on kosher. So Callisto, Laudis, that's our group 27, the bleaching herbicides, a tank mix with atrazine, and if you want to spike in something like status, uh, we're still getting excellent control post-emergence in corn on kosher, so that's why I just don't really have slides addressing it. <clears throat> My watch says about five minutes, so maybe I'll just show, in this case, well, all right, do you want a little bit of pre-emergence data on water hemp or some cover crop data on water hemp? Pre-emergence. Pre okay, I wanted to show this. And, uh, sir, you had a question before I move on. Anything new in sunflowers? Unfortunately, no. It's the easiest way to put it. <laughs> uh, for, for water hemp and palmer, we really like the Authority Supreme Authority Edge product because sulfentrazone or Authority is pretty good on, on palmer and water hemp, and so is Zidua. And that's probably about the best premix we can get to for kosher because sulfentrazone will be our best on kosher, and we get a little bit of a benefit from Zidua in that type of situation, uh, just not as big of a benefit as we do on the pigweeds. So we'd probably go towards one of those two products pre-emergence. And they're newer on the active ingredients we've had for a decade or more, but as far as pre-mixes. Yeah, George. Uh, group 15, what's your favorite or what's the difference between like seed and floor, dual, all foot, soft Okay, specific to pigweeds, generalized? Kosha, yeah. Kosha. Okay, so the group 15 products, and just uh, for simplicity's sake, I'll just do the trade names. So Zidua, 
Warrant, Outlook, and then Dual, the main group 15 herbicides we'll use. For Kochia, we really only see any activity at Ozidua. Outlook, Dual, and Warrant, we, we just don't really count on that, giving us much residual control of Kochia at all. So Ozidua is, is really one we'd rely on where we'd actually say there's some activity. For the pigweeds, Zidua would be the best, kind of year in and year out. A caveat is Zidua does need quite a bit of moisture for activation. At least half an inch, one inch of, of rainfall is best for activation of Zidua. Next, I'd say Outlook and Warrant are pretty equivalent and would be kind of next best on water hemp. And again, in, in comparison, Outlook only takes a little, bit more, a little bit more than a tenth of an inch of rain for initial activation. So if you can guarantee you're gonna be in a dry pattern, Outlook may be a little bit better because it doesn't require as much moisture. And then we've, we've just gotten, we've seen acetylchlor look very good uh, multiple years in a row. And so we kind of put that equivalent for Outlook. Some years actually maybe Warrant is a little bit better than Outlook for us. We're probably gonna be a little bit drier than you guys mostly. And we're all gonna be dry comparatively to other people, but. And then Dual is, is gonna be the, the lowest ranking for the pigweeds for us. Probably unfortunate because that's the one with most generics and probably the cheapest, but it's not gonna be as good as the other three group 15 products. Other question we'll get, just since it's on my mind with those products, dual metolachlor is the only one that will photodegrade. So last year we were so dry, I think we got asked this a thousand times of the pre-emergence on the soil, what's gonna be there when we finally get rain, that's gonna be the one that's gonna degrade in the sun, will be dual. The other three are pretty stable. We'll be there waiting for a rainfall event. Okay, so general thoughts in soybean, then I'll show uh, some new data that I've got um, for primarily the extend soybean market. And that kind of gets us to 12 o'clock then. So this is both water hemp and Palmer control. Always assume glyphosate resistance and resistance to group two herbicides like Raptor or Pursuit. So with that being the assumption, Here's kind of the, the list of all the products that we would recommend for control of water hemp for palmer and soybean. For residuals, that the top three are, are separated for a reason. Those would be the, the better residual products for pigweeds. So the authority, valor, or residual products. The other group 15s, uh, metribuzin, if you use at least six ounces of product, and then anything yellow will also help us out. So yellow, prow, treflan, also give us residual control. Uh, if I was king of the world and could give you all the money you wanted, Authority or Valor plus Zidua plus Metribuzin would be my, my Cadillac program. So that exists in some premixes like Fierce MTZ, or if you did like an Authority Edge plus Metribuzin. Gets pricey, but that's gonna be the best for residual control. Post-emergence, we still have several options for the most part. Um, I don't know where you guys are sitting as far as resistance to Flexstar, Cobra, or Blazer. We don't have any. I know South Central Minnesota is getting quite a bit, a few more populations. If you don't have resistance, those will work on any traded soybean. Otherwise, Liberty, Dicamba. Within the Enlist system, so different from Kosha, where I said, you know, 240 is not going to work. Enlist plus Liberty tank mixed on water hemp has really been one of our best programs post-emergence. So those two together will be better than, than separated out. So if you have enough liberty for one shot and you're in the enlist system, I'd tank mix it with enlist on that first pass. So the other thing I wanted to just mention as far as some newer residual data, um, this is set up for the extend market. And so this is a trial that we had up north and I did see going through the South Dakota's um, weed control results, it looks like the exact same protocol was brought down here as well with pretty similar results. So that's kind of good to, to know that what I'll be talking about uh, equated down here quite well. So a little bit hard to see, uh, but basically we had a, a, a program where we had one, two, three, four, five different uh, residual products with and without extended max pre-emergence. So the 22 ounce rate of extended max, half pound of dicamba. And what I want to point out here is that we, maybe as academics have been wishy-washy on our feelings about dicamba pre-emergence uh, because for residual from dicamba by itself is not really all that good. And there's a reason we didn't have dicamba by itself in this protocol. 
but mix it together with some other pre-emergence herbicides, and we do see a benefit, more consistency uh, for residual control on some of our broadleaf weeds, especially on water hemp. So just wanted to point that out. So we're going to see by itself, I won't recommend dicamba residual. It's going to be that 30 to 50% range probably. Premix it with other active ingredients. That's what the bottom part of this slide is, is basically the top five treatments with Extendamax. And seven weeks after planting, drought year for us, I want to point that out. Don't always expect 95 to 99% control seven weeks after planting. But for us uh, in our dry conditions, and we do know with dicamba, the drier it is, the better residual control we get. If you have a program like that and get a two inch rainfall, then the dicamba is probably gone not too long after that two inch rainfall, but the other products will, will then persist a little bit longer. The ones that were kind of worse there up top was uh, just Warrant by itself and then Valor at two ounces by itself. So I don't really recommend a single effective active ingredient. The other reason I put this slide together is I wanted to show this crowd specifically, the next one. Oh, shoot, I'm sorry. Those look better in no-till than this is conventional till. So the one thing I want to point out with water hemp that we know, in no-till conditions or no-till settings, a lot more of our water hemp emerges early in the season, and we won't have as many subsequent flushes throughout the season. Compared to conventional till, we tend to have more consistent number of flushes or more consistent plants emerge with every subsequent flush compared to no-till, we have more plants in that first initial flush. And so that's why we saw worse results in conventional till. So again, that's conventional till, there's those products no-till. And I'm sorry, I did run a couple minutes over. So I know I did send the slide deck a little bit late, so hopefully the PDF will be available for the rest of the slides we didn't get to for everyone who's here. But that's kind of the nature of when I put this slide deck together is I know we'll, we'll talk about what we want to talk about and that's how far we got, I guess. So I'll be around for a little bit for any other questions, but I don't want to keep us later than I already brought us. <laughs> Thank you.